Buddha talks a lot about how to do meditation, because he wants you to see it as a doing. Sometimes things seem to happen on their own, but that's the result of past actions. What you want to focus on is what you know you're doing and the results of what you're doing right now. Because you do have that choice. You could be sitting here meditating, or you could be off doing something else. Or you could be sitting here doing something else. But you've decided you want to be here, you want to meditate, you want to train the mind. We're practicing. Same way as you'd practice piano or practice a musical instrument. Not just to fill the hour with activity, but to learn how to do something well. And so you've got how many breaths in the course of the hour? You've got that many opportunities to do it well. And if you've realized the last breath wasn't all that comfortable, you can ask yourself, well, what kind of breath really would feel comfortable this time? See how the body responds, and see how successfully you can stay with the sensation of breathing all the way in, all the way out. How steadily you can stay with that, because the steadiness of your focus is very important. The more steadily you can see things, the more subtle movements you'll detect. If you're jumping around a lot, you have no idea what else is jumping around. You can jump up and the ground beneath you could quake, and by the time you came back down again, the earthquake would be over. You wouldn't have known. So you try to stay here steadily, working with what the Buddha calls bodily fabrication, i.e. the breath, verbal fabrication which is direct a thought and evaluation. In other words, you direct your thinking to this topic of the breath, and then you evaluate it. You evaluate the breath, you evaluate how well you're staying with the breath, and you try to make improvements. And then finally, there's metal fabrication, feelings and perceptions. The perception is the metal note you make to yourself to stay with the breath or to stay with whatever your object of meditation is. And then there's a feeling tone that arises as a result. All of these things shape your experience, and you're doing them all the time. There's an intentional element in all of them, even in feelings. The Buddha says we have a potential for feelings at any one moment. There are lots of different potentials. There's a potential for pain in some parts of the body and potential for pleasure in other parts. There's a whole range of topics you could think about right now that could give rise to pleasure or pain. So for the time being, we're going to choose the things that are pleasurable. The idea of staying with the breath and training the mind, that's pleasurable. There may be a little bit of discomfort in the fact that the meditation is, isn't progressing as, as quickly as you'd like, but that's part of your motivation to work harder. And you focus on the areas of the breath. There is the body that are comfortable. Notice the ones that you tend to squeeze as you breathe in, or squeeze as you breathe out. Try not to squeeze them. Allow them to have a sense of fullness all the way through the in-breath, and even through the out-breath, leave them full. That's how the sense of rapture develops. Interfering as little as possible. and trying to gain a sense of how much energy you have to put into this in order to maintain it. Sometimes you put in too much energy and you get worn out after a while. You put in not enough and the mind just kind of wanders off someplace else. You have to observe yourself. Again, it's like practicing the piano. You have to listen to yourself play and be very sensitive to the movement of your hands so you can connect this kind of movement with that kind of sound. And then you can begin to make improvements 
How about changing the movement of the hand a bit? Changing the fingering, changing the way you hold your wrists, all the different things that go into the physical side of playing the piano. At the same time, developing your ear so you get a better and better sense of what sounds good. The advantage of seeing meditation as something you do like this rather than something that just happens is because it sensitizes you to this whole issue of fabrication, the way you shape your experience in the present moment. If you're going to find something unfabricated, you have to be very sensitive to what actual fabrication is and how many subtle, subtle, subtle levels there are. There's an interesting passage where the Buddha talks about emptiness. We tend to think of emptiness as a metaphysical absolute of some kind, the true nature of things. But when the Buddha talks about emptiness in conjunction with meditation, it's learning how to look at a state of mind that comes from concentration and see where there's disturbance and see where there's a lack of disturbance. The lack of disturbance is the emptiness in that state. What is the disturbance? It usually has something to do with the perception you're using. He gives an example. Suppose you've been in a village and all the issues that come around being in your village, all the people issues and the fights and whatever that come from being with people, the disagreements. Then you go off into the wilderness and you realize there are no human beings around, there's no village around, and all the disturbance that would come from being in the village are not there. It's empty of those disturbances. In the same way the Buddha says, you look at your meditation and he takes you through the different levels of concentration. You focus on your object, which you use perception to focus on it. And then you stick with it until the mind gains a state of singleness based on that perception. Like right now, we're focusing on the breath. Try to just really be with the breath as one single perception, i.e. the one thing you're thinking about and it's a perception that fills your whole body. You have a sense of the breath that goes along with the mental note. And it's a mental note that's, or there's a corresponding note in the actual sensation of the breath in the body, in every cell. Once there's a sense of oneness, then the Buddha says that you indulge in it. In other words, you allow your, your awareness to be soaked with it, to enjoy it. All too many times you hear people saying, well, try to do concentration, but don't get attached to it. Get attached to it. Gain pleasure from it. Gain a sense of fullness from it, because the mind needs this as food for its food for its practice. As John Fuang used to say, it's like the lubricant for an engine. The lubricant dries up, the engine's gonna seize up, and that's it. It's gonna stop working. So enjoy the state that you're in. Get really familiar with it. That's the best way to get familiar with it, is to, to enjoy it all the way down to the, your fingernails, your toenails. When you're really solidly with the breath in this way, then you can ask yourself, is there still any disturbance here? To begin with, you try to appreciate the fact that there are a lot of things you could be thinking about now, but you're not. Those concerns are gone. There's a sense of spaciousness. And then you ask yourself, what still is disturbing the mind? Well, maybe there's that idea that you have to breathe in and breathe out, or have to change your focus from now is the in-breath, now is the out. How about just breath energy without any concern for whether it's in or out, just there filling the body? What does that perception do? When you think of the breath energy, 
streaming throughout all the possible breath channels in the body. And thinking of your body as being like a sponge. There are channels everywhere. From the outer pores all the way in. Everything connects. When you hold that perception in mind, what does that do? Okay, if it feels good, indulge in it. Stick with it. Allow it to do its work for the body and for the mind. And then you can ask, well, what still is disturbing the mind there? And again, you find it's the perception, what you're doing in the present moment, that still is not quite as subtle as it could be. It's like playing your scales and realizing that there's a tightness in your hands that makes the scale sound wooden or choppy. How do you relax the muscles of the hand and yet at the same time keep them active enough so that your runs are like falling water? You do this by being observant about what you're doing and the results that you're getting. Now, the Buddha traces this through states of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, neither perception nor non-perception. Even the signless concentration of the mind. In each case, it's still a question of finding the right perception, holding on to it, indulging the sense of well-being that comes, appreciating the fact that it's empty of the disturbances that were there before, but still noticing, well, there's still some modicum of disturbance left. What is it? What are you doing now? What are you still doing that needs to be dropped? So when you hit these very spacious states, you don't start jumping to metaphysical conclusions about them. They're the ground of being or whatever. Anything that is maintained by a perception is fabricated. And the Buddha wants you to see that, because eventually you will go to something that's unfabricated, and you know it's unfabricated because you've been very sensitive to what the mind's been doing all along. But you have to keep checking it, because sometimes what seems unfabricated at the beginning becomes more and more clear, clear in an experience of fabrication as you get more familiar with it. But this is how we learn how not to fool ourselves. We get sensitive to the fact that we're doing something around these things, doing something that maintains these experiences. And as long as there's a doing, it's going to be inconstant. There's going to be some stress, some disturbance. It's not really worth hanging on to. You may get some pleasure out of it, and that's why the Buddha tells you to indulge in it and to settle in. But then when it's done its work for you, then you have to realize, okay, this can't be everything. It's got to be something better. So we're developing sensitivity, and that's what makes the practice work. That's what makes it worthwhile. If you just go through the motions, you can practice for hours and hours and hours and really not accomplish anything aside from being sick and tired of the practice after a while, because it doesn't seem to go anywhere. Sometimes you listen to people who've been practicing for many years, and they get this kind of mean tone to their voice. Well, I saw the deathless, and it wasn't all that much. If it was really deathless, it was amazing. That's what it should have been. Something's missing. They haven't been paying careful attention. The Buddha talks about the spoon and the soup. Just because someone's been in the soup for many, many years doesn't mean that they really know the taste. But if you make yourself sensitive to what you're doing, and always keep that as your foremost question, you'll be on the right track. 
We're not here to discover metaphysical absolutes. We're here to find the end of suffering. And the end of suffering comes when you begin to get more and more sensitive to what you're doing that's causing suffering and how you can end that activity. So it's all an issue of action. This is why the Buddha's first teaching was a, the Eightfold Path, something you do. His last teaching was the Eightfold Path, something you do. His first teaching to his son was to look at your actions, gauge their results, learn from your mistakes. So you cause less and less stress and suffering. That right there is the pattern for the whole practice. We're not here to be something, because being is a kind of activity. We're here to learn about what we're doing. See all these things as activities or the results of activities. And that's the right view that puts you on the path.